Okay. I got another yes. Pluto. Yes. What's the deal with Pluto? <laughs> <laughs> He's a nice dog. <laughs> uh, Pluto is still there. Okay? Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened to Pluto. It's still there. In fact, we have wait, NASA has a spaceship on its way out to Pluto that should be arriving there next year. Next year, watch the headlines for something called New Horizons. The, the news media is fantastic at not telling you anything until about a week before things happen, and then it's like headlines. So but look up New Horizons. This is a ship that was launched. Thank you, sir. 2006. It's the fastest ship that we've ever sent, and it's got, going to get to the Pluto area next year. And it's going to be studying Pluto. And Pluto has some moons of its own, believe it or not. But more importantly, Pluto is part of something called the Kuiper Belt. And the Kuiper Belt is just a whole bunch of leftover rock and ice and planetary bodies, small planetary bodies that are out there. The real quick answer to your question, because I'm being a little silly here. The thing is, is that Pluto was discovered in 1930. And they were looking for something that was big because they thought Neptune and Uranus were being moved by something. And they looked for 10 years for something, and they found this. And they thought this was a big planet. And then after they started looking at it for a while, the voice is awfully small. It couldn't have affected Neptune and Uranus. But it was the planet that went to the same. And over the years now, we found out that it's got smaller and smaller. Ready for this? It's smaller than our moon. That's how small Pluto is. It's a tiny, tiny planetoid. Right? And so the other thing is, though, is about 20 years ago, they found something else out there. Got it. They found out, I'm getting it. They found another planetoid out there that was bigger than Pluto. And it's, we found a 10th planet. And then the thing is, we're going to find other ones out there because it's part of this Kuiper Belt. So there's probably a lot more out there. And now we know that, as opposed to 1930, yeah. that Pluto is simply one body in a whole bunch of small bodies that are way out there past Neptune. So what do we do? Make them all planets? You have a heck of a time memorizing all those planets, right? So now we're down to eight. They call the leftover stuff that was in our solar system that got thrown out by gravity, and they're just kind of all sitting out there. So comets come from too. So, so Pluto is still there, but we promoted it, and we now promoted it. We're one planet, and now we're eight times. Four solid, four gas. Who was right? You were right. He was. See? They're always right. They're always right. Thank you again for putting up with that. Uh, uh, welcome again to the New Jersey Astronomical Association. My name is Paul Cirillo. I'm the membership chairperson here. You know that? Membership chairperson? Okay, so remember that. All right, we have membership applications in the back. But I'm uh, pleased to have you tonight. Thank you for coming. Like I said, we have a good night probably with the weather. We've got great planets out and lots of things to say. But uh, at this point, uh, let me introduce the uh, featured speaker tonight. It is uh, Mr. Alan Witzgall. He's a senior optician for ESCO Optics in Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge New Jersey. He holds a bachelor's degree in planetary science from Kane University. He is an active member here at the at NJAA uh, in Highbridge, and he's currently serving as our vice president. He is also very involved at Amateur Astronomers Incorporated of Cranford, New Jersey. His career in optics came from building telescopes in his basement during his high school years. In 1977, one of them, a 10-inch reflector, took first award at Stella Fame which is the birthplace of amateur telescope making in America. To date, he has traveled halfway around the planet to view five total solar eclipses, and in 1986, gone down under to Australia to view and photograph Comet Halley. In his professional career, he has created precision optics for the Lawrence Livermore Labs uh, Nova Fusion Reactor, the imaging uh, infrared spectrometer, the spectrograph at the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, the NICMOS camera at the Pic Divini Observatory and the spectrograph for the Gemini North Telescope. So he sure that knows, it sounds like he knows what he's doing. He certainly is. He's an honored member of this organization. And his topic tonight is to involve the Earth, the five great epochs of in our planet's history. Uh, so all welcome to Alan Wittsock. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to see if I can sneak my way past here. There we go. After hearing that uh, resume, every time I get more and more, 
I'm just staying in class. I'm not tired lately. Like, like, <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about a subject that's actually getting more and more exciting as we go. Even this week, more information came in about this topic, which of course is the evolving Earth, the five great epochs in the history of our planet, <laughs> or how life on Earth has affected the composition and the fate of our planet, and may tell us of other Earths in the galaxy. Oh, and uh, before I go any further, uh, I don't care what anybody else says, it is still the planet. Okay? <laughs> you don't have something out there 1,500 miles across it has an atmosphere, five moons, and a ring system, and it is not a planet, please. Okay, and we're going to talk about this one here, much warmer. <laughs> Okay, just a thought we'll start with. Something's hidden, go find it. This is Rudyard Kipling, and by the way, I think that that particular quote is perfect for science in general. I don't care what it is, whether it's astronomy, physics, and all of its divisions, chemistry, there's always something hidden. And our job as scientists, amateur or professional, is go find it. Okay, so when you make a planet, you're technically using recycled matter. About seven billion years ago, somewhere in our galaxy, a supernova exploded, forging the elements that make new stars. Essentially, you have a star that's a little larger than our sun, four or five times its mass or greater. It burns through all its hydrogen, its helium. It will go all the way up to, through the chemical elements until it hits iron. Iron is a nuclear dead end. And a few moments after enough of it builds up in its core, it becomes unstable, partially collapses, and explodes outward. And I'm not going to go any further than that except to say that the ashes of exploded stars are us, or our planet, our solar system, and even our sun. Okay. Okay, forming the sun on the planets about 4.6 billion years ago. Dust and gas accreted to the sun and some leftovers. So the running joke is that the solar system is actually because of mass. The sun. Jupiter has some junk left over. We're standing on that right now. One of the hero worlds being born. The protostar we call the Sun started its nuclear fire up about 4.5 billion years ago. Essentially, out of the solar nebula, the gases and dust that were left over from not just one supernova, but a whole group of them, <clears throat> gravitationally started to collapse. And if you ever see a skater, when she pulls her arms in, she starts to spin. When she puts her arms out, she slows down. The same thing happens here. Gravitationally, slowly but surely, matter fell in toward the center of one particular area here in this nebula, this gas cloud. It starts to turn to rotate, still keeps on collapsing, forming the sun in the middle, and you see those instabilities here, which are where the planets form. This is the current view, or at least the inner current view right now. And the flash of ignition of the sun, however, stripped away the original atmospheres, whatever was there from the inner planets. And outgassing from within our planet, gases blown to the top to the surface through volcanoes or other means, replenished the atmospheres of the inner four worlds. Here's the Earth. It doesn't look very much like Earth at all, does it? 4.45 roughly billion years ago, Earth is sweeping up dust, comets, asteroids, gaining more and more mass as it goes. Uh, it was a heck of a time on the planet. There was no solid surface at this point. Okay, now, here's how you build a planet. Asteroidal materials are found, for example, in this meteorite. The NWA here, by the way, stands for Northwest Africa. This is the 869th type of meteorite that has been found. Now that number's in the 8,000s, because the hot deserts of Algeria and Morocco preserve meteorites. Usually, if it fell Say if a meteorite right now fell in, out here in the back behind the observatory. <coughs> Within about 100 years or so, it would be just dust because the rain and the snow and the wind that we have here on Earth would erode it very quickly. And if you notice, there are little white flecks all scattered through there. That's if this camera was a little bit better, you'd see they're metallic iron. And of course, iron does not last very long in an oxygen atmosphere like we have. Roughly about 250 minerals developed in interactions of magma and water, not just from comets, from, but also now we know from the solar nebula itself. And the reason by the way I mentioned that, 869, is because it is a very, it sounds like a double pun, it sounds like a rock group, okay, cheap meteorites. Well, in this case, you can get on the web, you can type in, Google NWA 869 for sale. And you will see this very, very cheaply. You can get your own personal meteorite for maybe under $10. Well, 
And there's literally hundreds of thousands of kilograms of the stuff scattered around. Now here's a major milestone. Earth had just formed. It was only 50 million years old. And a Mars-sized object crashed into the Earth, ripping away the original thick crust of the Earth, merging its iron core with that of our planet, and actually speeding it up a little bit in its rotation, and forming our moon in maybe as little as a year. I love this particular painting over here. This is done by a planetary astronomer, as well as an artist, a William Hartman. And here's the proto-moon, our Earth. Look how close that is, not even 10,000 miles away. I mean, I can stand, somehow you could stand on the surface of the Earth and look up and watch that moon literally fill the sky. That's how it looked back then. And the tides it would kick up from its gravity, remember, there's not enough water yet on the surface, so the tides are actually the molten rock just below your feet, picking you up maybe 40 feet and then going back down again. Scary, you know? Well, anyway, I like the detail he has here, too. Notice that there's an impact over here, and there's the shadow of it over here. Beautiful attention to detail. I've seen the original painting of this. This is really a poor imitation for it. Now, the Hadean period, yes, from Hades, meaning like hell. Black Earth, as it's called, about 4.4 billion years ago. Our sun, still very young, is only about 70% of its current brightness. Molten magma flows all over the surface of the Earth, and yet this is a, a fragment of quartz with zircon, zirconium silicate, within it. Zircons are very, very good. They will trap water, they will trap radioactive materials, and hold them. Very, very stable from a geological point of view. But studying these show that some areas on Earth at the, are still solid at this time. The planet differentiates. All the light stuff floats to the top. It forms a core of iron, and then a, an outer core around it of liquid metal, of liquid iron. Our atmosphere is a wonderful nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and a lot of water vapor. No free oxygen. That won't be for some time. But here's how you build continents. The current, current theory seems to indicate that large late impacts and a late heavy bombardment. Asteroids came in, fractured the early crust, and allowed magma to rise up to create the continents. And the oceans form the same way, by the way. Originally, not too long ago, I mean, we're, we're talking information that's only about a month old right now. The current theory is that we don't have comets come in by the trillions and melt and form the oceans. Apparently there was quite a bit, and still is quite a bit of water, literally below, just below the surface. Where today it's about 400 miles down. Its composition is locked in a, a rock called ringwoodite. But there was enough water 400 miles down that if you could extract it, heat it up, boil it out of the rock, you could create an entire new ocean on Earth. And apparently this is how it formed, and the continents formed literally from islands. So when they call Australia an island continent, they're not kidding. Okay. Now this is a relic of the late Hadean. How many people here have gone to Canada? Hey, a bunch, me too. Anybody going to Hudson Bay? Okay, very few people do actually, there's not much up there. But there's a section there called uh, Corpus Cove. And there you will find one of the rare places on Earth, only about three, I believe, that are known today, where zircon very nice, yeah, G-N-E-I-S-S is pronounced nice, and it is in this case. This is what's left of mountains that at one time, roughly four, a little over four billion years ago, equaled the Alps. And all the glaciers and all the erosion here on Earth ripped it apart to this nub left over. But it turns out this outcrop there dates to an astounding 4.35 billion years. Now, right now, there's a little bit of a controversy. Here they say it's about 4.4 billion. And the Australian researchers that have gone to their pieces of this type of rock say, oh, no, ours is older. It's 4.4. So there's a war going on between Australia and Canada in that regard. Now, I've seen some of this material on the other side of Canada from Acosta, and that's about, roughly about 4.0 billion. It's astounding, this material. There's only a little bit on Earth left. And the rocks and minerals of that period, remelting of the early crust, concentrate scarce elements into rocks and minerals that we see today. If you go to the Palisades, you see lots of this here also in the watch on basalt. If you look around some areas, you'll find tourmaline on lipidolite. Lipidolite's interesting because that's lithium, which we use on our car batteries. So of course, tourmaline is a gemstone. Mm -hmm. And feldspar, which is all over the place. In this case, the variety is called plagioclase. Okay, crazy question. How many people have seen the moon? 
Everybody, right? I know, it's a dumb question. And you've seen the full moon. The full moon is so bright because of that material. But apparently sloughed off the earth as well. Now here's an example. I mentioned that we concentrate elements together in minerals and in rocks. In Aklo Gabon, a natural nuclear reactor apparently operated for at least several centuries, about two billion years ago. All the radioactive materials washed down from the mountains into the river gullies, deposited itself. Then when the floods came, it was covered with sand. More of this material, sand, layer after layer. Here you have a moderator, the sand, between the radioactive materials, and then you have water as a coolant, nuclear reactor. And there, by the way, the reason we know it, but apparently it did occur, is because we don't see so much uranium here. It's depleted, burned out in this reactor. But we see the border elements, a material that is left over from burning of uranium like we have in our nuclear reactors. But here it is in nature. Okay, a redder, the Archean period's great oxidation event. About 3.8 to 2.7 billion years ago, uh, $20 words here, oxygenetic, oxygenic photosynthesis dominates. In other words, al green algae start to come up. About 2.7 billion years ago, standard photosynthesis takes over. And the oceans of Earth were kind of a sickly, kind of orangey, reddish, icky, kind of, sometimes to green. Suddenly they went to green, and it went brilliant red. You would think that if you were approaching a spacecraft back then, you were looking at Mars rather than Earth. It bonds with the newly released oxygen, literally rusting out of solution and forming these massive iron and other ore deposits we have today. Algae conquers the earth. This is a stromatolite, so I'm very happy to have this piece. It's 2.3 billion years old from Bolivia, South America. Right now, modern versions are in Western Australia. In this case, the rise of modern algae in the form of stromatolites radically changed the earth's atmosphere, oxygenating it, forming a protective ozone layer, which is of course critical for life here on earth, and drastically changing the composition of the minerals and rocks there. Some 2,500 new species of minerals and a like number of all kinds of rocks come into existence with the presence of oxygen and water. Partial melting and remelting as the continents move across the face of the planet, concentrating only rare and dispersed elements in the Earth's crust. <coughs> well, again, here's my stromatolite, a mineral called rhodonite, which, by the way, you can find very easily up in Franklin, New Jersey. And beryl, this piece came from New Mexico. That's still quite a beautiful piece of work. The mineral is of the period. And in the oceans, the Precambrian seas, more than a billion, almost about, let's say around a billion years ago or less, the typical day in the shallow seas of the early Earth. This is a nice uh, panorama that's, uh, interestingly enough, is made from glass. There are some museums that they had some people work on this, little baby jellies, nice quiet little sea pens that are filtering the oceans for a tiny microscopic life. This is what it would apparently look like if you were able to be on orbit around it. And then we have continental drift, the first supercontinent from north to south pole, Rodinia, Russian for home, is born from the uniting of early land masses around 1.2 billion years ago. But it creates a huge open ocean on the other side of the Earth. And we have tons of oxygen and almost no car real carbon dioxide. We get some ice ages, but ice age is not like what you we had with the uh, caveman. Much worse. With too little carbon dioxide, snowball Earth. This is the Proterozoic era, where basically modern algae dominates the ocean. That allows an ozone to form, but dioxide, oxygen, water vapor, nitrogen, a little bit of carbon dioxide. The sun is almost at full brightness as it is today. About 2.5 billion, then 800 and 600 million years ago, lack of CO2 allowed the entire planet to just about freeze over. At the poles, or near the poles, the ice was almost two miles thick. This is left open a little bit because there are probably some areas where you can still punch through a little bit. But the Earth was not just sitting still underneath the ice. Under ice volcanoes were pumping megatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And finally, this melted that two mile thick ice sheet. But then you had a massive greenhouse effect that lasted around 100 million years. Uh, right now, if you go to Antarctica, they're saying that the glaciers are melting because of human effects on carbon dioxide levels on Earth. They would have flipped if they found out, the uh, same people, if they found out the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the air then. Instead of being 300, 390, 400 parts per million, it was up around 3,000 parts per million and greater. 
and yet life still survived pretty well. And we needed it to get rid of the ice. Interestingly enough, too, by the way, uh, the ice in Antarctica is interesting because we now know that there are volcanoes underneath the particular glacier that they're worried about, and they are pumping out heat. If you take a heat probe and sink it here in North America, you get about 65 milliwatts, 65 thousandths of a watt of energy coming out per hour. If you do that in the same place, drill down through the ice and then put it into the ground, same depth, you get about 200 to 300 milliamps. Mill, uh, milliwatts of energy, heat energy. So basically, this is a natural occurrence. What really scares me was what happened was in Iceland, where there are volcanoes under about a mile of ice, and they are very active. And that blows. Uh, what was it? About two, three, two years ago, three years ago, uh, the, the the one of the volcanoes erupted and it stopped air traffic for about a month and a half. Imagine something 20 times that great, with all the steam explosion, all the dust and everything, stopping air traffic, and maybe affecting cooling down the planet for maybe five or ten years, that could happen. Just something to keep you awake at night. <laughs> now, you have the supercontinent and pen called Pangea, all Earth, breaks up. The beginning of the modern world's land masses started about 560 million years ago. The star of the Cambrian era, is all the great animals that lived back at that time. Virtually all that you see seen in here went extinct. Life takes off in many pathways, kind of like life experimenting, which works better. Competition, like you wouldn't believe. And the chemistry of the planet starts to resemble, starts to resemble the current time. Okay, about 450 million years ago, Earth starts to, from a distance, starts to look very familiar. You have the rise of land plants and eventually animals, allowing for an explosion of new life. And most mineral deposits concentrate all over and under the planet. It's very nice, it's very friendly, I can't expect to see a four foot long cockroach come out of the, uh, the bush here. And life continues modifying the environment. This is calcite, its variety is aragonite, it's a relatively high temperature mineral. And this is a trilobite from the Devonian period, roughly about 380 million years ago. Its eyes are made of calcite. But especially those people in the front row, you can see each one has like a light edge and a dark center. That's because somehow this has evolved so that the edges of the, the lenses focus light a little bit, colors of light a little bit differently than the center. It's called varying the index of refraction, how it bends the light. This guy had blue eyes at one time because of the mineral content and saw or could see in color. And it was looking up to make sure nothing was coming down after it. <laughs> predators and such. You notice all the spines over here. We finally got smart when we started breaking apart the rocks. We don't break them apart anymore. We know that there are trilobites in there and other fossils. Take the whole chunk, bring it home, and slowly but surely take off the layers. And in doing so, we find out there were a lot spiny, more spiny than we ever could believe them to be. So they had some kind of competition going on there. Okay, so here's how our planet has changed. Plate tectonics. You know, if you, if you said that there was continental drift, Oh, about 60, 70 years ago, you would have been kicked out of uh, the local geology department. Nowadays, it's an accepted fact that the continents of Earth move across the surface because we have below the continent's movement of the mantle of the Earth, all the heat that's trapped there from the creation of the planet. This is the Permian, which, uh, interestingly enough, when this happened, when Pangaea started to break up 225, 250 million years ago, it is also called the Great Dying. Whatever did this, whatever broke up the continents, it's believed to be a combination now of massive volcanoes in what today we call Siberia, Siberia Traps, as it's called, uh, steps rather. And on the other side of the Earth, and here, where Antarctica will eventually be, there is a crater roughly 300 miles across. It's a, what they call the antipode, exactly opposite from the volcano. So this is the, that those are volcanoes we think are going about a million years. They were putting more carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide in the air. That's okay. But when this hit, the shock wave, that's, according to one theory, went to the other side of the planet and literally blew it into high gear. Ninety, between 90 and 98 percent of all life on Earth perished. We are the results of the, those survivors from 200 million years ago, the Triassic, everything's breaking apart. The Jurassic period, the Earth actually dried out a bit then. 
the Cretaceous period, of course, that everybody knows 65 million years ago, an object about you know, roughly around the size of Manhattan crashed into what today is the Yucatan, and that wiped out the dinosaurs. Interestingly enough, if you were on Earth, you were unfortunate enough to be on Earth when that happened, the impact occurred at, say, time zero. The shock wave from that was traveling at Mach 22, 22 times the speed of sound. It reached New Jersey in 15 minutes. You had that long to get out of the way, like in getting off planet. And then, of course, present day. So now, after all this study of the Earth, the early Earth, what does this all tell us? An instrument called the spectrograph allows us to have a tool that we can determine if there are other Earths out there in space and about where they are in their evolution compared to how we are. Knowing how the Earth appeared in past epochs lets us understand what we are seeing when we look at exoplanets in our search for avatars, I love that word, uh, to our planet around other stars. <coughs> This is how a spectroscope works, essentially. You have a white light source, and you have a slit to narrow the field of view just to one area. It goes to a prison. No, this is not stolen from uh, Pink Floyd. I love that album, though. And it breaks into individual colors. These colors have messages, because look, if you have different chemical elements that form this light or are contained in this light, they will leave their signature in the form of dark lines absorbing absorption lines as they fold across the spectrum. You can identify hydrogen like we do here on Earth, the sodium, the two lines that are very close together, and calcium almost at the point where the human eye cannot see. It almost seems to be ultraviolet. But it allows us to tell the chemical composition. The chemical elements that are down here are the same ones that we see in stars and even in other exoplanets. I'm sorry, folks. There's no such thing as kryptonite. It just disappeared, see? Uh, there is no... There are, well, Laotrope does exist, but I think it was actually a, a plot of science fiction. And other things like it. You have 90, depending on who you read, okay, someone's going to, qu going to question me about this. There are 94 naturally occurring elements. Some of them are radioactive, so they decay rather quickly. There is no, for example, there is no naturally occurring uh, Neptunium and Plutonium, 93-94. But they did exist at one time because of the presence of those nuclear reactors. You see the daughter products from it. And there are stars. There's element 61, Prometheum. I love the name. It was originally uh, named for a titan that was a uh, brought fire, brought knowledge to humanity, according to Greek mythology. Prometheum is radioactive, but it's been found in the, in the outer atmospheres of giant stars. So it does exist in nature. But those elements can be analyzed from here on Earth with the power of a spectroscope. Okay, so when we run it through a spectroscope, this is what you would see. If you looked at Earth 3.9 billion years ago, this would be the signature, and it would be in the infrared, in the energy of heat. You would see the presence of water, some carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and, and the water presence, which is very important, of course, for life. About 3.5 billion years ago, the red Earth, oxygen and water, are abundant, and sure enough, you can see the water signature and the carbon dioxide signature. Two billion years ago, a massive amount of carbon dioxide, snowball earth, and water is quite prominent too. But a hothouse follows, and then the la in the last total freeze over, photosynthesis controls the carbon. Plants, trees, algae in the oceans are the regulators for carbon dioxide, which is why it's so crazy that people are cutting down trees left and right around the planet. Our oceans can absorb a lot of carbon dioxide, but there's, there is sort of a limit too. We're not quite sure where or when. But this is what we would like to see. There's a perfect signature for water. Look at this over here. Carbon dioxide is a little bit lower. And most importantly right here, O3, ozone, to shield out the ultraviolet from a nearby star so that light can arise. Now, the cool, oh yeah, let me go back one. The cool thing about this, just this week, I was reading an article uh, put out by Scientific American that there is a gentleman there right now that believes that not, obviously not Hubble and not Kepler, which is been finding all these wonderful planets that we're, we're currently seeing, but maybe the next generation after the James Webb telescope, the thing that hasn't even flown, they're already looking to the future. A future space telescope should be able to image directly a planet like our Earth, and be able to look at individual pixels of light, pixel elements in the picture, and analyze it 
and be able to see mineral abundances. So here's how you find a planet. And in this case, this is HARPS, the High Accuracy Radio Velocity Planet Searcher. I love how they get these abbreviations. Looks for the Doppler shift. You're looking for a planet moving around the star as it's coming or going away from you, it shifts to the red. As it's coming towards you, it shifts off to the blue. That Doppler shift in a neutral position. You see this, and this is a very difficult thing to do because the spectroscope has to be very, very stable temperature. All everything has to come together. They have set this at the time this was written. There was over 700 possible planet candidates. It turns out in that case, there were almost a thousand. Okay. This hopefully will someday fly. The terrestrial planet finder will block out the light of a star while looking close in for a dim light of an Earth-sized planet. It turns out that the Kepler spacecraft is already doing quite a bit of this work, and now they're working at Kepler-2. You probably all have heard, or many of you, I hope, have heard, that Kepler's gyros had three and a backup, and it's only got two gyros left. But they're using an effect from the uh, pr pressure of sunlight to be able to keep it steady enough so instead of looking at just one area near Cygnus, the swamp, which by the way you'll be able to see the constellation tonight, is going to look across the path opposite from the sun, what we call the ecliptic, where all the planets and the sun and the moon follow. And they will be able to look at many, many thousands of stars. So the number of planets that are going to be discovered in the next maybe six to eight months is going to skyrocket. Okay, there's Kepler. This is the field of view right now, or was right now, just off Cygnus, and for those that are familiar, of course, this little red patch over here is the North American Nebula. There's Deneb and Sadr over here, and this is the Kepler field of view. This is a 19-inch telescope. Many amateurs have instruments about that big, but none of them are in space like this, and none is well controlled. It basically watches, as you can see up here in this artist's rendition, watches for a planet to transit across between us and its parent star, like so. Now this is greatly exaggerated, of course. The actual dip is very, very, very small. However, this is basically shows how it would be when it's away from the star as it just cuts into the face of the star and in the middle. This drop allows us to be able to detect that there is something there, something hidden that we go to find. And of course, it's limited in its speed. Earths would take about roughly, if they're similar to us with a similar star, it would take about a year to do this, but you keep watching. And maybe in a few years, uh, this is actually a little optimistic, it would be coming up on uh, November 2014, we got to change that date I think, uh, just a little. But uh, it'd be nice because it's my birthday that month, As a matter of fact the day they're going to premiere Planet Hunters and such. But there it is, Terra Nova, Wonder World Habitable Planet Found, and various other things over here. So if we're very lucky, maybe in a few years we will have it on the cover. I know what's going to happen. Back in 1980, when Voyager first went by Jupiter and went by Io and saw the volcanoes, it was a publisher's nightmare. The cover of Science Magazine, the cover of Na Nature Magazine, Popular Science, Popular Mechanics, Scientific American, everybody, Sky and Telescope, Strong, you name the magazine, if it was remotely connected to the sciences, it had the same darn picture of the same darn volcano. But it would be great to do that. I would, I would live through that again very, very happily, knowing that we quite literally are not alone, at least planet-wise. So remember this from Carl Sagan. At somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. And he was ahead of everybody in uh, predicting that eventually we would find planets. And uh, Who knows? So many of the young people in here We'll probably be talking about the first attempted at probes to go out to some of the nearby ones. Uh, there are studies that just might make something, maybe not quite warp drive, but extremely fast vehicles. I mean, going to Alpha Centauri in uh, about, say, 20 years is very good. Normally, with our current rocketry, if you go 40,000 years, it's, it's fast. So who knows? Maybe. Okay. And I'd like to thank my wife, Bonnie, for uh, getting this together. She's the one that put together that National Geographic uh, copy. Actually, I picked it off a newsstand five months from now. Uh, Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker were planetary scientists. Richard Kroll was my, uh, my mentor, a geologist. He tried to convince me desperately uh, to go into pure geology, but I'm an astronomer. 
I want to get down to it. And Herb Zim, author of Rocks and Minerals, where I got a lot of this background again after about 35 years of being out of, of college. And one more. The editors of Life Magazine. Fantastic. I was a third grader. I saw this. That's the Hadean period. Look at that moon in the background. It is a monster. They thought it was only 50,000 miles away. Today we know it's 10,000, so it would actually fill the field. And there are still things that are hitting, as you can see, meteorites coming in and crashing into the molten lava, and the beginning of a continent, and rain, and lightning, and all the chemicals that eventually form life. And it amazed me. It still does. And that's it. And I thank you for your attention. Al's willing to take some questions, if you have some questions for him. <coughs> don't be shy, I don't bite. <laughs> okay, guys. In uh, one of the episodes of The, the New Cosmos, uh, yeah. probably like the 11th episode, it was about mm -hmm. uh, almost li like life uh, stowing away on meteorites. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can mm -hmm. you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, that, that is a theory that goes back quite a ways. It's called panspermia. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have life, say if it developed on Mars, Okay, which is the current one that everybody loves to talk about. You have meteorites, that, uh, asteroids will crash into it, blast material off, and the theory goes that Earth eventually sweeps it up, or another planet will sweep it up, and the conditions are right, uh, they will apparently thrive and they'll evolve and such. Uh, right now, uh, of all the meteorites that have been found on Earth to date, even the ones that come in fresh, I mean, they found uh, Peekskill, New Jersey, they could, uh, New York, I wish it was Jersey, uh, New York, they picked it up that night. So it was clean, it was pristine. Tagish Lake, Canada, they had a number of people watch as these pieces come down, bright as the sun in the middle of the night, and went out onto the ice and got these dark materials, very primitive carbonaceous material, carbonaceous chondrite, $20 word for it, meaning it contains a lot of materials, very primitive, very old, no life. When we went to the moon, you'll see it in the uh, display back there, Apollo 11, they kept the, the astronauts in isolation for three weeks, just to see if anything developed, nothing. By Apollo 14, all they did was gave them a quick, uh, quick checkup and they gave them a, a parade, because there was nothing there. There's nothing alive on the moon. I mean, there's a great YouTube where some creature that somehow was able to hear in vacuum was able to four astronauts and such, but it's great, great fiction, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, panspermia has yet to be proven. Even cometary material, uh, later, uh, I think it was that next year, Bon, uh, is or later this year, November, we're going to be having uh, the European Space Agency is landing a probe on a comet, Comet P67, and I cannot pronounce the two Russian names, you'll forgive me, but Comet CG, as it's called, will have a visitor land on its surface uh, called Philae, which will be left from Rosetta, which will go with the comet as it goes around the sun and develops and as it goes out and cools off. This is going to land on site. It's got uh, 12 instruments that will allow it to be able to analyze it, but I doubt they'll find life there too. Yes? Uh, can you discuss what the current status is of the uh, probe that uh, was um, um, supposed to be uh, sent to Europa to try and find life <clears throat> underneath the ice of Europa? Okay, um, the current plans are for a Europa orbiter. It has been surmised that eventually we would get a probe out there. Europeans tried to do it, they got budget cuts. NASA keeps on getting budget cuts left and right. And the bad thing about it, of course, the bad thing about it is that in each case, it is a worthy object to look for because it does have that thick ice cut, uh, crust. And we know just from the path of spacecraft going by it, there's an ocean at least 10, maybe 50 miles deep. So the, the ideal thing would be to have a probe land close to one of the cracks in the ice, send a, a heated probe down, melt through the ice, go down 50 miles, and because the gravity is so light, it's the same pressure you would have here on Earth at the bottom of an Olympic swimming pool. So any probe could be made relatively sturdy. And you turn on the lights, and I would like to think that they would find a European sponge. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's my toned down one. The one I really want is a three tentacled manta looking at it and wave, holding up a sign saying, hi, you know, stop and be friendly. Uh, but it would be nice. I would, I would be happy with that sponge. I would be happy with a baby brine shrimp running by. I'm holding an amoeba. 
<coughs> I'll take anything because it, even if it's an amoeba, even if it's a virus, we're not alone. Right. And that, that's the big thing. You know, we are, I'll say like it is, we human beings are scared little primates. We're, so we still remember uh, the, we still remember the saber-toothed tigers and the mastodonts and the giant ground sloths and all this. And we still, we're terrified. We, want to, we don't want to be alone. We're a herd animal, if you will, much as some people may think we're not, the way we yell and scream at each other. <laughs> but we want to know we're not alone. And maybe we'll find someone whose name will translate out to, they, their racial name will translate out to, we who survived. Maybe we should be using that ourselves. I'd like to think we will. Any other questions, please? Yeah, I see here. Uh, personally, do you think there's life in our solar system? Well, yeah, you're standing in the middle right now. <laughs> uh, but I know what you're talking about. Um, I, I, in my personal opinion, I think that there was life on Mars. We might find fossils. I'd kill to have a Martian clamshell. Maybe someday we'll get one. I don't know. Uh, Europa, as we mentioned, has an ocean. It has this wonderful heat source called Jupiter that its tides melt the interior. Enceladus is very exciting because that has cracks in that Saturnian moon that allow us to be able to probe in with Cassini. It just goes right through the plume and it's salty water. Now, where have you seen salty water before? Right here on this planet. So of course uh, one of my friends had to, had to do this. He said yes and you'll call it the bird's eye moon. I said what? Yeah, you're open, you know, the uh, Enceladan fish will come over and say I wonder what uh, that crack goes! <laughs> Instant froze. I was like, okay, good. Stayed away from him for a couple weeks. <laughs> but maybe he's right. Maybe there's a whole stack of fresh Enceladan fish or some kind of life form that, like us, is very curious. And sometimes we curious animals don't survive too well. But maybe they will. So I, that's where I think you will find it, at least as, as current theory goes. I'd like, you know, they, they, it's been said that when a <clears throat> prominent scientist says something is possible, it pro he's probably right. But if he says something's impossible, he's probably wrong. So I'm going to say there is no life elsewhere in the solar system, so I can prove him wrong. There we go. You heard it here first. I had a hand over here. Hi. Um, okay. What do you think they will do if they do find life on Earth? I mean, not on life on Earth, but <laughs> other planets. It. But on other planets? If, <laughs> if the life, form, life forms are lucky, we will leave them alone. If we find intelligent life, and I doubt we will, you know, like we are, you know, talking meteor leader take kind of thing. Um, there is a possibility we might be able to communicate, I don't know, maybe. Uh, if we finally contact life well beyond the Earth that has the capability of traveling here, maybe we don't want to have them contact us. Because mm -hmm. every time a more advanced civilization here on Earth has met a somewhat more primitive one, there's been disaster. Look at the American uh, Indian and South America, even worse. Uh, when the first Spanish uh, explorers went down there, it was a paradise. It was beautiful. They came back 40 years later. It was even better, a more beautiful place, because there was nobody there. Was 27 million Native Americans died from diseases like measles and smallpox that were brought in inadver inadvertently. So we ought to keep away from them. If they, they want to have contact, it'll have to be done very, very carefully. How? I really don't know. Anyone else? Yeah. What's, what's the status of the SETI project? I haven't heard much about it. Okay, uh, SETI right now, there are a number of programs that are going on. One, there are two of them actually. One is radio, and they're getting more and more of the Allen Telescope, as it's called. It's a number of radio telescopes, I believe it's in California. Uh, they are listening on uh, several million channels going up and down the, the radio spectrum, hoping that maybe someone is broadcasting. Uh, the other one is optical SETI, where we think that maybe they're using high-energy lasers to be able to communicate to send signals. But that's a very difficult one, too. Both of them are. The only cool thing about this was back in, I think it was 1970, it was 77? I'd have to look again. A radio astronomer, a graduate student actually, uh, was watching a chart coming out of the computer, radio, relative radio signals, and suddenly he got a massive signal, two of them. And he was so impressed by it, he circled it and wrote the word WOW. So it's called the WOW signal. You can get more information about that if you just Google WOW radio signal and you'll get it. And you'll be able to read the entire story. So many people wonder if maybe, uh, maybe there was an accidental release of uh, radio energy that, you know, they see all these primitive people 
that are here, and they don't want them to know they're there. And somebody unfortunately opened a, a, a door, and the radio signal leaked out. They slammed it shut and probably fired the guy that did that. At least that's mm -hmm. one theory. It may be it was a natural signal, probably was a natural signal of a source that we don't know what happened, where it came from. We know where it was. In Sagittarius, if it, uh, those that are familiar with the constellation, the teapot, just on the left side of the lid, there was two areas there. For a precious 35, 40 seconds, what could be very much an artificial signal. But that's it. We have nothing else. So shame that. Any other questions? We better hold off for now. We got okay. Yeah. Well, we got Al. Certainly, be here to answer any more of your questions, as will uh, uh, many of us else here at the observatory. Well, I again, on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank you again for a fantastic thank presentation. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. <laughs> Keep believing. Keep believing, everybody, that science, scientific thought, is the wave of the future. Not just in astronomy, but everything else. Because after all, that's how our civilization is where it is now. And great guys like this egg me, ask me, egg me on. I mean, ask me to, to come in here and to talk. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just for a few quick announcements, then I'll let you go. Uh, the sky has got a little bit of.